All right, welcome everyone. Uh, we are very happy to uh, have our keynote lecture uh, for the first day of the CBSE days. Uh, I'm extremely happy to introduce uh, Alana Sporoguzek uh, as our keynote speaker uh, for, uh, for this year. Um, Alana is my, uh, my mentor and friend and I've learned a tremendous amount from him and I spent a couple of years uh, working in this group. And so Alan is originally from uh, Mexico, uh, got his undergrad degree at UNAM, uh, went to, this, to the States and got his PhD at uh, UC Berkeley. He stayed at Berkeley for another while as a postdoc and then uh, got a faculty position at Harvard, uh, spent a couple of uh, years at Harvard, got tenured, and then he did something that uh, not many people expect uh, someone to do who, who went through the tenure process at Harvard. Uh, he left it all behind and he went to uh, Canada uh, for an extremely nice job um, at the University of uh, Toronto, uh, where he's now a professor in chemistry and computer science. It's a very unusual situ situation and setup. Uh, he's also one of the chairs of the uh, Vector Institute um, and has a number of other affiliations uh, over in Toronto. Um, so Alan has a very interesting research portfolio. Uh, he works uh, both in the area of uh, quantum, chemist uh, quantum chemistry, that's his uh, natural hunting ground, really, that's where he uh, I got his uh, uh, formative years in and his, his uh, original research contributions. Uh, but then he moved into other areas uh, such as uh, quantum computing uh, with applications in chemistry. Uh, he's been working on, uh, on the high throughput screening studies, machine learning and data science. And more recently, uh, he's uh, combining these uh, virtual studies with uh, work on uh, robotics and automatized uh, labs. Uh, Alan has uh, basically won all the awards that you can uh, win uh, in, in all of these fields. Um, uh, let me just point out one thing which I find uh, quite remarkable is that he's also an entrepreneur. Uh, he's uh, founded and co-founded um, a couple of companies and uh, two which are particularly noteworthy are Kibotics and uh, Zapata, uh, both in the area of um, uh, quantum computing and in the area of machine learning for uh, chemical and materials discovery. Um, so without further ado, uh, uh, we can uh, start just uh, a couple of uh, household uh, housekeeping things. Um, we are recording this lecture. The lecture will be um, put into, uh, onto the webpage in a couple of days. Uh, we are also turning on the live transcripts uh, for people with, um, uh, with uh, hearing impairments. Uh, you can uh, turn off the, uh, the, uh, the live transcript if you don't want to see it. Um, and uh, you can put questions into the chat box already. Uh, we'll ask the questions at the end of the lecture. And uh, if people have live questions at the end, uh, you can ask them then as well. So uh, let's see. Okay. Live transcript. Um, so Alan, take it away. Perfect. Can you hear me? Yes, right. Yes. Okay. Okay. So first of all, uh, if my connection gets slowed down because Lake Ontario cables under Lake Ontario or something, just let me know and I'll repeat myself. Uh, second, um, uh, I'll be monitoring the chat if there are immediate questions, and if not, I will take them at the end. And thank you, by the way, Johannes, for your very generous introduction. Uh, it's a, always a pleasure to be introduced by one of your illustrious former work co-workers, and it was a pleasure to work with you uh, and now seeing you flourish at Buffalo. So, um, so this talk is kind of like a like I talk about what to do with a quantum computer. Uh, and I, I know you, you had two previous speakers talk to you about quantum computing. This one is mostly gonna be focused on quantum simulation. Um, but, oh, well, okay. So I like to always start this, my quantum computing talk to thinking about why are we doing this? And, you know, about 2,200 years ago, the Greeks built this device called the Antikythera. It is a gear mechanism that actually allows you to simulate the motion of the planets using classical gears. Okay, so it's amazing, right? 2000 years ago, we had classical technology and we were able to simulate the motion of planets. So simulation is a very important aspect. And in this case, we are highlighting the fact that this technology was used. Um, well, when computers came around, uh, it was it was kind of uh, you know using them for simulation was was not obvious at the beginning but it really flourished during the Second World War almost 80 years ago, and this beautiful book by Peter Gallison talks about that beautiful era where physics computer science uh, get together and create a new field the field of computer simulation, and Peter talks about this 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 idea that without computers 
our world will not be the same. This computer that I'm presenting to you was designed by another computer, what does it designed by another computer? So uh, basically our physical reality around us all was designed by computers nowadays, especially in the high tech world, right? So that basically tells you that uh, uh, simulation is very important for humanity. Okay, so that's the area of teaching the computer simulations. But, you know, uh, I'm gonna be showing this. Uh, this is a very special slide, but for Johannes and me, because Samuel Boys uh, is kind of like uh, our, our uh, uh, has been our grandparent uh, or so on, or great grandpa academically uh, for both of us in multiple ways for Johannes, in, case, in my case, only one way. But what is interesting about him is he also looks like Johannes and I, so that's also cool. Um, so Samuel Boyce was the person that used the first molecular simulation on a digital computer that was general. And his students, which went to win the Nobel Prize in the case of John Popol, uh, growed this sentence, okay? He, he was thinking about the, the idea of predicting, okay? How can you use a general computer program to predict the quantum mechanical properties of matter, okay? And, and when he presented this in the 1955 Boulder, Colorado conference, it sounded weird as, as, as Handy and Popol and Isai Chavez say about him, okay? So remember that date, 1955, you know, this is 15 years or so after the main computer in Los Alamos. And it gives you an idea of where people were thinking, okay? And I will argue in this talk that quantum computers are at more or less this stage, maybe two or three years before this stage, okay? This is kind of where you want to be in, in terms of historical you know, nature uh, of where we're going. So it's cool because it, you know, we're basically you know, almost 40 years from the visionary paper by the started this all, which is Richard Feynman, where he, he proposed in a single paper, which is his most cited paper nowadays, both the idea of quantum computing and also the idea of quantum simulation. So I really recommend you if you are like interested in this field to check out such a paper. So I would like to say also that this Apple advertisement, you can tell this is a think different Apple advertisement. Okay, I could even use my little pen and like, you know, show you that here. Um, you know, uh, basically shows you that Apple has been going downhill in terms of their advertisement. This is an advertisement that I just saw recently, right? So it looks much more crappy. Uh, but anyway, um, what happens in your iPhone stays in your iPhone. So anyway, um, so why would you actually simulate something on a quantum computer? Why would you simulate molecules, materials, or other things as I will talk about um, on quantum computers? Well, because if I take something like a molecule and the molecule uh, uh, here is, I'm showing you acetone, can be mapped to a mathematical model, in this case, uh, say the time independent or time dependent Schrodinger equation, which is quantum information as well. But then we commit uh, usually a scene and cram that in a classical information processor, like the computer that I showed you before of Samuel Boyce. But you could also think about using another quantum machine, in this case, a quantum information processor, and from there extracting classical information, such as its energy or a property. If you do this, if you continue quantum, 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 it was the hint of Richard Feynman demonstrated by my former uh, colleague in Boston, but also friend, uh, Seth Lloyd uh, at MIT, that it is efficient to simulate a local Hamiltonian on a quantum computer, Means, meaning that uh, it is possible to do what is impossible with classical computers, okay? So what do you mean by that efficiency? So this is a paper by actually a student of Popol, the student of Boyce, which was my postdoctoral advisor. So uh, Martin Hedgordon, Gordon, where he talks about like, you know, the different costs of computing of different approximate methods of solving the Schrodinger equation. You might not have heard, depending on this heterogeneous audience, what these methods mean. Needless to say, these are polynomially scaling methods, except this one that says exact here, okay? For simulating the Schrodinger equation. And this is the uh, advances in them predicted just by the growth in computing power. It is possible that the algorithms get better and you get further advancements. But this paper written in 2008 has been holding out really well. And if you were to extrapolate to today, this is about where we are in supercomputing. But this exact simulation, notice how it doesn't advance very much. But what Feynman and then Seth Lloyd, and then actually uh, I worked on it very early on as well, 
showed is that you know these polynomially scaling algorithms in quantum computers will eventually, and this is just of course a hypothetical cure, but this is not really along these lines, you know, but will hypothetically eventually solve exact problems better than a classical computer, and then eventually cross over these approximate methods. And therefore, we will go into the era of predictive simulation rather than approximate or explanatory simulation of matter. And I think that will be revolutionary because now quantum computers within a basis will give you the exact answer to the Schrodinger equation routinely. So what is quantum advantage? So uh, as Johannes mentioned, we started a company called Zapata. And I'll tell you more about Zapata if we have time in this talk. But uh, you know, basically, we build software for quantum computers. And we think a lot about what does it mean? What would a quantum computer will really help? And we say that regardless of any theoretical argument or any kind of uh, you know, formal you know, advantage, we believe that when a quantum computer will be useful in the world is when any process in a company is replaced by a quantum computer in a box. So if, if you find that any computational process for some reason, it can be time, power, cost, etc., we're running it in a quantum computer replaces a classical computer, we enter the new era. And that will be the era of quantum advantage. And Zapata is working really hard to get there, to understand how to get there. So I have already, you guys got an intro about quantum computers, but I also know from Johannes, this is a disparate audience and some of you might need refreshers even if they're very brief. So I'm gonna give you my three slide introduction to quantum computing. You already heard from the previous speakers, but the whole idea is that qubits are a superposition of the classical computing states zero and one. You can think about them as two quantum states where you can actually work with their superposition. As you know, these are complex numbers. So therefore, uh, you can um, you can actually uh, have uh, these phases, right? That, that that allow you to, if you normalize in this particular case, normalize the the, the wave function, and, and and remove a global phase, you can represent a qubit as this point in a sphere, which I'll be talking a lot about graphically, because zero will be pointing up in the sphere, one will be pointing down. That will be the classical states. Superpositions, for example, could be anywhere else. Well, in the equator, they're equal superpositions and they can have a complex phase that allows you to move in the equator, uh, you know, along the Z X plane. Uh, the features that make a quantum computer quantum will be the superposition, entanglement, and collapse upon measurement. Okay, those are properties that, uh, you know, are properties of a qubit and the properties of the computer is that you can control, okay, and you can are able to fight the coherence with quantum error correction. I will just mention in quantum error correction as a magical tool here. I don't have time to explain to you how it works, but basically think about the same way classical computers can error correct. The quantum ones use quantum mechanics to error correct, but in a similar way using what is called codes. Okay, so I'm gonna be answering questions. If they come in and they enter my flocks, I will answer them. So Johannes has a question, the difference between supremacy and advantage. Yes, I kind of skipped it, but it's important. So, uh, supremacy uh, is the idea of a quantum computer doing any task that is very hard to simulate on a classical one. Okay, and we'll come back to it in a little bit in this talk, but uh, former group member, actually, I think he overlapped with Johannes in my lab, uh, Sergio Boixo. I'm very proud of that, actually. Sergio, when he, he was at Google, but he used to be in my lab as well. Sergio came up with the idea of, can we come up with an algorithm that you cannot, that doesn't matter what it does, it samples basically kind of scattering of billiard balls in a Galton board, like quantum optical amplitudes, right? It's, it's just the way you want to think about it potentially, because, you know, quantum amplitudes over a random circuit. Uh, the distribution that comes out of that sampling is very, very, very hard to simulate in a classical computer. Turns out Google was able to, to do that with one of their current quantum computers, and this became a huge deal you might have heard on the news. So that was called supremacy. I don't like term because it could have some horrible racist term, uh, you know, connections, and I hate it. But anyway, it's called supremacy, uh, and I cannot do anything about it. But the, that thing called supremacy is uh, different than advantage, right? Because there's no practical benefit of doing it other than showing that a classical computer has a very hard time simulating such a distribution. Still very interesting that a quantum computer achieved that last year. So hopefully that answers Johannes' question. 
and we'll come back to it in a little while. Uh, okay, Frank Tsai is talking about how uh, there's ways of simulating Google Sika more classically using tensor networks. That is correct too, Frank. This is gonna be a moving scale. I'm not too worried about that because if Google had five more qubits or 10 more qubits, then that tensor network will not work again. So it is really a race. And the fact that maybe it's possible to simulate Google's machine now, but it wasn't back then and vice versa, is just a, 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 re a reflection of the race between the two, okay? So that's in some sense to me, not that much, not, not, not that relevant. It's, it's just a fact that things are moving along, okay? We'll come back to that point. So uh, now, when you think about a quantum algorithm, uh, and this is a task, this is a slide that I really, I really have pride on because it was a slide I used as my postdoc interview in 2005 and I'm still using. So I like to say that it has had its use, okay? So we're talking about 15 year old slide, but that there's kind of like this conceptual idea of a quantum algorithm, right? You're gonna start in a classical state, say all your qubits pointing up, right? As remember in this block sphere. And then these qubits are gonna then uh, be pointed, you know, in a superposition along the, the, the equator here. And then the algorithm is all about uh, moving around those amplitudes and perhaps reconcentrating them around your answer. And probabilistically upon many measurements, you might come up with a distribution that is centered upon your answer, which in this case was the classical number one zero zero. So that's how quantum algorithm works. And what we do in quantum algorithms is program that sequence of operations. That is not obvious, right? So how do we program them? We think about it as a musical score, okay? So this is an example of a quantum algorithm. This is an algorithm that is carrying out a quantum Fourier transform, one of the primitives that we employ a lot in quantum computing. Uh, it is composed by what is called one qubit gates and two qubit gates. For example, this one Hadamard gate will take you from the uh, poles to the equators of the block sphere. And these rotations depend on an angle theta. There will be rotations along the three axes of the block sphere moving the arrow that I was trying to pictorially show you all around it, okay? And it's quite important to also have on top of them uh, this control node operation, this operation that entangles two qubits. It could be any entangling operation, but this is an operation that actually takes care of making two qubits talk to each other. And is that sequence of gates left from right? These are the qubits, uh, these are the cats of the qubits, operated on by these gates from left to right that ultimately develop the quantum algorithms. And um, therefore, when we think about circuits, we think about their input, which usually is classical states, although sometimes you think about a circuit where you already pre-prepared some quantum states. The length of this unitary operation, if you might recall that in quantum mechanics, uh, these are basically use gates or sets of gates that can act on one or more qubits. Eventually we're gonna measure and therefore probabilistically collapse the qubits along the usually X, Y axis, sorry, the, sorry, the, the, the C axis of the, of, the, of the quantum computer, so zero or one. And then this output will correlate these classical uh, numbers here with this input, okay? And therefore uh, that's how you wanna think about an algorithm. And we'll be talking a lot about how many qubits you have and how many gates you have before you reach the coherence or your quantum computer becomes useful um, and so on. So to do universal quantum computing, again, you can use the rotations and the scene notes I told you before. So this is kind of like my, okay, intro to quantum computing. I know uh, we, we could also have had a tutorial in this conference where somebody went through this in a day, okay? But it gives you a flavor. So this is where my own career started. I just joined as a postdoc with Martin Head Gordon's group. And uh, you know, we were able to actually show that Seth Lloyd's algorithm could be employed for chemistry. Like we could uh, use these algorithms to simulate many body systems in quantum computers. And with all the information I told you, and if you know enough physics, you might be able to understand what's going on here. This is a quantum wave function psi that is undergoing unitary time evolution, successive powers of this operator U, which entangled with these qubits, okay, uh, and followed by an inverse quantum Fourier transform will give you an amplitude uh, proportional to a phase, which in turn, this phase phi is in turn proportional to its energy. 
So you might have heard, oh my God, a land told me an algorithm in a very long time. Well, that was my entire puzzle in a, in a minute. But what really means that is that any quantum mechanical uh, 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 object, if it's in an eigenstate, will have its face rotating at a speed proportional to its energy. This algorithm phase estimation, uh, what allows you to do is see how fast that phase is rotating and extract it. And it's kind of pictorially cool because what it's doing is entangling it a time register with an energy, uh, a register that has to do with time here, expressing a binary powers of two. And so far we have time evolved in the time domain, then do a Fourier transform, we go into the frequency domain and read out the frequency. Okay, so kind of like pictorially, the algorithms can be drawn like this. This is give you an idea. What was cool about this algorithm is that you can actually show, and this was shown in 2005, that you have a linear scaling, right, with the number of quantum bits with respect to the number of basis functions. So cholesterol, a molecule very close to my heart, will require more or less the same number of qubits as, as for example, simulating, uh, factoring a number. And this started a huge field, right? Like, I mean, people now think a lot about molecular simulation as one of the first applications of quantum computers. Okay, so, I mean, the story has to be kind of short and I have to tell you where we are now. So we are in an era that might, might have been mentioned by our previous speakers called NISC, the Noisy Intermediate Scale Quantum Computers. And the idea is that we have quantum computers that are not there uh, in the terms of error correction. They cannot be error corrected here reliably. Having said so, we're growing and growing the number of qubits towards there. So we're moving from the classical world to the quantum world and somewhere, somewhere there, we're in this verdant place of NISC where we argue it is potentially possible there will be algorithms in chemistry optimization, machine learning. There might not be, okay? We believe that there are many cool things you can do. What I mean, there might not be, might be the case that it's very hard to compete with a classical computer and get quantum advantage all the way until you really have error correction. Although I do believe we will get it uh, for many reasons. So you want to learn more? OK. And this is a single talk. Turns out there are uh, the field moves so fast that I was involved in writing these three articles. And notice that they were written 2019, 2020, and 2021. And I argue so much has happened that it is actually merits to be involved in three reviews. And notice that this is a chem rev. This is a rep mod phase. These are huge, OK? And this was submitted, by the way, for full disclosure, also to Rev Morphis, okay? Because it has a different scope. This is chemistry, mostly led by the group of Simon Benjamin, okay? And this is, uh, this is chemistry as well, in more from a chemistry perspective. But just to give you an idea, how many algorithms are there for these computers? We, call, we, we, we partnered with Long Chuan Chek uh, from, from Singapore, and Kishore Bharti is for South, or this is my group members that contributed on it, and, and, he, and their group members in Singapore. And, and grow this review about this, right? So we were quite lucky because we wrote this first paper for quantum computing for chemistry, but also we were together with Eddie Farhi and uh, published this paper back to back, we published pretty much the first two NISC algorithms. So Eddie published an optimization algorithm and we published the so-called variational quantum eigensolver, okay? Which is an algorithm that allows you to simulate the energy of molecules in NISC computers. I'll tell you how it works because that's kind of an algorithm I can tell you all about in terms of a lot of the progress in it, or a lot about, I would say. But we also developed one of the early applications of quantum machine learning, the autoencoder, and also one of another one of the early applications of generative models of quantum computers. So these are the examples from my group. This one's already published, by the way, in machine learning science and technology, I apologize, or quantum science and technology. I have to update this slide. But basically, all of these algorithms, what they're doing is minimizing or maximizing some objective function. And they rely on the variational aspects of quantum mechanics, the variational theorem. But more generally, there are more type of NISC algorithms beyond the variational algorithms. And in the review that we just wrote, and really here the credit goes to basically the, the, the first authors of this paper, you know, the real group members that actually spend all the time doing this. This is just a type title, right? So this is our paper VQE. Uh, these are different papers that talk about VQE, but the adaptive version of VQE. But then you can see here, variational fast forwarding, for example, scrambling, thermal state generation, structure simulation, non-equilibrium states, 
All of this is just uh, many body physics and, and chemistry simulations. I would like to note, if you read here, the years of the algorithms. Okay, so just pausing here, right? Just for humble, humbleness, right? Most of the stuff came out in 2020, that's what we wrote a review. This is incredible. To keep track of this is incredible. So we are writing this review in such a way that all of this is gonna be in a live table online so that people can submit updates and we can have this table be live because this is gonna move really quickly in 2021, 2022. So these are algorithms for machine learning applications, some of them, there's many more, but you can classify them until here. There are some contributions again from my group, like this paper with Jonathan Romero. And uh, excuse me, my admin is texting me. Um, uh, okay, giving a talk online. Um, sorry, uh, we'll check after. Sorry, uh, when my admin texts me, that means basically it, it is hitting the fan and something's going on. And luckily it's not now. Uh, but anyway, uh, um, so here are uh, algorithms uh, for machine learning. And more importantly, I guess, uh, uh, I wanna emphasize there's areas where many of you can actually um, really participate on. Uh, for example, optimization for combinatorial problems uh, and also I believe finance will be bigger and bigger. Here's finance and numerical solvers, like SBDs or linear systems. Okay, notice how linear systems just exploded in 2019. Nonlinear differential equations, etc. I was involved in this paper on quantum factoring. So anyway, very minorly, by the way, this is basically work done as part of computing. So anyway, this gives you an idea of the view of what to do with a near-term quantum computer as a meaning, right? But obviously we have to be, go into something and let's go into variational algorithms. So this is an example of kind of like the big picture. This is kind of like a rinse and repeat cycle, okay? So what we're gonna be doing here, okay, is actually is gonna be going around in circles, okay? Um, basically uh, taking an initial quantum state here. I'm gonna try to use my pen here. This is my, the teacher and me, okay? We're gonna take this initial quantum state here and we're gonna make it go through this circuit, okay? So what happens then after that, you're gonna end up with a, with a final quantum state. Our key realization when we designed the variational eigen solver, okay? Which again, credits here go to Jarrod McLean and Mahong Jung, is the fact that this circuit could have a polynomial number of parameters theta here, that you can vary the same way you're tuning a guitar. A good analogy for a, for a variational language solver is you're tuning a guitar, changing those parameters in some way. And those parameters in this case will be varied to try to, in this case, just minimize the energy. That's the simplest possible objective, okay? And for that then you can use a bunch of classical solvers to update such parameters, prepare another quantum state. And therefore there's a lot of problems that you need to solve. You need to solve what is the best way to measure here? What is the best circuit here to prepare, right? Uh, can you do clever things here, etc.? And I argue these variational algorithms basically have all sorts of really, really cool advances in all of these areas. But ultimately, it harks back to very simple quantum mechanics, okay? This is just a variational theorem. So notice how then, for this variational quantum eigensolver type of problem uh, or variational algorithms in general, you have problems because you have, not problems, but you have limitations. This is an ansatz, okay? So therefore, for this particular case, uh, uh, you need to figure out what is gonna be the circuit. And the other thing that you need to care about is that this is gonna be an approximate solution to the Schrodinger equation. It's not gonna be exact as I promised to you earlier with the previous algorithms we published, you're gonna have to kind of like live with these approximations until we get to the, to the full, uh, uh, you know, error corrected quantum computers. So we're very proud of something else in that paper. We, we proposed at the time sounded so, net, so crazy, but I think we were the first ones, maybe we weren't, but I think we are, that wrote QPU in a paper. Quantum processing unit, sounded crazy at the time, but now people call these machines QPUs and it, there's a reason, right? In the VQE, we said, look, it would be great because you will have a room full of these quantum computers. And therefore each one of them will calculate one of the elements of the Hamiltonian because ultimately the Hamiltonian is additive, right? So you could in principle take you know, element one and run it in one quantum computer and element N and run it in another quantum computer, 
right? Uh, and therefore, addition will be just done in a classical computer, you know, the classical feedback, okay? So uh, this is what I think clever at the time, but I think it's very interesting that now it's kind of just taken for granted. So it is not unlikely that you're gonna have supercomputing centers full of quantum computers to be able to take advantage of this variational parallelism. So now uh, going back into more like the depth of quantum chemistry, uh, you need to take fermionic operators and in particular the generators and convert them into spin one half distinguishable particles called qubits. So qubits are not anti-symmetric uh, uh, in nature in terms of like fermions. Like if you swap two qubits, like it's not gonna be the same algebra if you swap two fermions. So you need to actually do the so-called jordan bignet transformation or any, many other types of transformations to go from one to the other, okay? And it is all this machinery that we're kind of just here sketching that in some sense is kind of hard to, to make happen without a lot of software. And something that has changed, uh, well, anyway, but before getting there, uh, where, what are people doing? There's tons of people in the world working on this now, right? As I told you, like tons of paper in, in, in VQE. And people are thinking about how to do adaptive ones, I'd say, new copper cluster, unitary copper cluster methods, optimizations, circuits, reductions, okay? Uh, and as a speaker, I'm gonna do something I can't resist anymore. Uh, so, you know, fix my typo. I've been giving this talk so many times. Let me fix that typo. Okay, so, uh, just for example, the number of measurements at the beginning, my papers were criticized by Microsoft and there was this big fight between Microsoft and my lab because they were saying, even if you were to do what Alain wanted to do, there's a lot of measurements and Microsoft worked on it. Former group members like Ryan Babush in Google worked on it, many people. But my colleague and collaborator and friend, Arthur Ismailov from the U of T has a paper last year where he gets a scaling of N to the 1.4 where N is the number of uh, orbitals, let's say. And 1.4 is the scaling that you require in terms of number of measurements. This just shows you like, you know, the progress just in a year in reducing a particular power. And, and you, many of you know in quantum chemistry or any algorithm, these polynomial powers really matter because they will require the difference between days or months of a quantum computer to hours. Okay, we'll come back to that. Okay. So now, uh, it's quite funny how history turns around, I'm being historical in this talk. In 2015, when I was writing these, my first papers on simula quantum simulation, the package name that I, I called it was called Tequila, Tony's Quantum Information Library with Alan. Tony Dutoy, now a professor at the University of Pacific, uh, and I wrote that package. So when we wanted to write our new modern package, which is described in this paper, turns out that we also called it Tequila, okay? and um, uh, but now it has a different acronym. But what Tequila is, is a package that I strongly recommend if you wanna do quantum chemistry on a quantum computer, stands on the shoulders of giants or many other different packages, but allows you to take something that you will write on a blackboard and literally write this Python code to actually run it. Super high level, uh, you will require very few, few, few lines of code to actually simulate a molecule or simulate a material using this. And also you can go inside the guts of it and actually modify it really well. So um, it's cool talking here in front of Johannes, which by the way, is one of the people that really pushes software development. Uh, for example, his package mammal is an example of that type of black box that you wanna give to chemists to do machine learning. In our case, we wanted to do something similar to what Johannes did for in quantum computing. So, this is an example of how you will actually simulate the, the, the benzene molecule um, using such a code. And again, I'm not gonna go into many details, but you can see here the active orbitals you selected and their symmetries. And this is just the code standing on the shoulders of classical quantum chemistry packages, Google's JAX, which is a fantastic tool for automatic differentiation, Open Fermion, which is uh, a tool developed uh, by many former group members in Google on, on um, on um, um, you know, fermionic operator transformations for quantum chemistry. And of course, many optimization packages, of course, backend simulations from many companies like Rigetti, IBM and Google, etc. So Tequila is a glue in this beautiful quantum software ecosystem. So 
what can you do with calls like tequila nowadays? This is incredible, right? In whatever we are. So this is the moment where, I mean, the, the analogy of tequila is really good because I would like to say that tequila is what the quantum computer can do. But as a good Mexican, uh, I like to drink my tequila with lime juice. And we say in Mexico saying that if you have a lime, you have to squeeze it to the last drop because limes, you know, are more and more expensive and precious. So I'm gonna take my tequila with my lime. The lime is gonna be the classical computer. Let's just squeeze it to the maximum because the more we squeeze the classical computer, the taste of the tequila will be. And why is that analogy interesting? Because uh, if you wanted to do uh, the traditional way of doing quantum chemistry, it is extremely wasteful because in classical computers, we have tons of bits and we have tons of RAM. We really don't think about too much about parallelizing over many basis functions. But in quantum computers, qubits are expensive. So we should use the best basis for our qubits. So therefore you can do something very basic. And Jacob Gottman, a fantastic postdoctoral researcher in my lab, what Jacob has been doing is using this code called madness. In particular, do multi-resolution multi analysis for the single particle basis, generate the pair natural orbitals, and then truncate them based on occupation numbers instead of truncating the, the orbitals just heuristically, and then building qubit Hamiltonians that we can fit to the VQE. Notice how we just basically squeeze the line much better, but at the same of the time, we have the same tequila, which is the amount of quantum cu of qubits, and then run the variation and algorithm. And what's really, really cool about this is that the number of qubits required for actually estimating a full basis set extrapolation is sometimes reduced by more than a factor of 10, like in this case, okay? Or maybe factors of two or three, as you see in other different examples, right? Depends on the, on the system. But this shows you then, uh, depending on which metric you use as well, but basically this tells you roughly uh, the advantage of actually thinking about the classical algorithm. So if you wanna think about where the field is, is trying to figure out what are the best tricks from quantum chemistry to try to simulate your molecules better and better. For example, uh, this is one that actually will go back also to Johannes's previous life. Um, uh, I think Johannes, as well as my former student, Roberto Olivares, that went to the group of Garnet Chan, worked very early on on density matrix aromatization group. And there you have an issue of how to order in a line your orbitals. So we took that technology to actually figure out the, the strength of entanglement between the different uh, qubits to try to build the best possible circuits. Okay, and we have this paper uh, in quantum science and technology that tells you how to use mutual information to adapt a unitary couple cluster ansatz. Basically figure out what is the best way to cut gates, cut corners. Uh, I'm looking at the time. I'm gonna skip the meta VQE, okay? And I'm gonna skip the derivatives, okay? Uh, just because I really wanna have time for questions. So I'm gonna skip a few things from this talk, but ob obviously this talk will be available online and also will be available, um, you can email me and I'll send you a link to it. Nothing is secret here. But just to give you a big overview. So obviously in my lab, we're thinking about what's next, what's next, what's next, right? So, I mean, it's great that we did the variational eigen solver. We cannot just rest on improving the variational eigen solver. So uh, when Tiha Kiel came to my lab, I told him another crazy idea I was thinking about. What if the, another use of quantum simulation is a meta use, is a quantum computer simulating itself? And I wanna to try to convince you that's important. We now talked about supremacy again, this Johannes was asking about it, the idea that you know, a multi-qubit quantum computer carried out something that you may or might not be able to do with a supercomputer. Uh, Frank Tsai already was making these arguments uh, about perhaps it's not yet, but it doesn't really matter. Uh, supremacy was achieved and supremacy was also achieved uh, by China. Uh, Zhang Weipan has this fantastic, beautiful quantum optics setup that is like kind of like a, amazing uh, to do Boston sampling type experiments. Um, so this is a number of transmons in processors like the quantum supremacy qubit of Google and all these qubits, you can see they're growing roughly linearly in time, right? Some sort of Moore's law, right? If you think about it. Uh, in the sense that every qubit that you add, you double the number of, of possible states you could address as you, you know, as you carry out your quantum computation. So the number of transmons grows like there, that's a log linear plot. 
I love this plot in time that I've been showing you. And then what I tell you is, what if there is a moment where simulating that qubits is hard? Arguably, this happened with supremacy, right? It was hard to simulate something that happened in those qubits. So if you kind of look at the power of the IBM Summit supercomputer, ah, Johannes is asking me, what is a transmon? A transmon is just a qubit element. I'll show you a picture of it before, but it's a superconducting element that has a just some junction and a couple other knobs to try to you do a qubit using superconducting circuits. That's what is a transmon, Johannes. Okay, so uh, the number of transmons in quantum computers keeps growing. You can think about them as qubits, Johannes, just number of qubits. Uh, it's just a type of qubit. But then you can see how simulating such transmons will actually already is, is not possible with this larger supercomputers. So we said, well, what if we take a transmon and simulate it in qubits? What is the overhead? And turns out the overhead is about four data qubits per qubit. So if you wanted to simulate one qubit, you need 16 energy levels to simulate it, a la quantum chemistry, so to speak. And for that reason, we argue that there's going to be this beautiful moment in the next two or three years. So this is kind of a prediction I'm making, right? Where a quantum computer won't be able to simulate its own elements as well. And therefore, you will need a quantum computer to simulate itself. And remember the beginning of my talk, actually, that's what inspired me to think about this. Chips are designed by chips. That's the whole idea of computer-aided design for semiconductor design. We're entering that era with quantum computers. And we call that area QCAP. And therefore, what we did in the lab is use the same tools that I know as an old dog, time, time evolution and phase estimation, and also the variation and ligand solver to show numerically and also in the paper, right? Uh, and I'm going to skip this, uh, that we can actually simulate uh, quantum computers. This is one of those papers that we're going back and forth with the reviewers. Uh, uh, you know, when you go to certain journals, reviewers get pretty, you know, prickly. But uh, to answer your question, Johannes, this is the picture of the electrical circuit, so to speak, of of a, of a, of a trans mode. These are uh, just have some junctions uh, that you can control with electric fields and you can have, you know, uh, capacitors and so on. So uh, I'm not an expert on that. My postdocs are experts on this design of quantum hardware, especially TIHA, okay? But what we're experts on in the lab mostly is also how to do quantum simulation, okay? So we were able to take these circuits and map them to, to take this hardware and map its Hamiltonian and show how to simulate its energy levels, its avoided crossings, and its dynamics. Okay, and I'm gonna skip a few slides here. Okay, um, to make sure I have ten minutes for questions. Right, this is the kind of thing. I'm the last speaker of the day, and I don't wanna annoy you. Okay, um, just to tell you what the heck Zapata does. So many people don't understand. So Zapata does many things, but Zapata sells something. And by the way, Zapata could give this, uh, we have an academic program, could give it very soon to academics. Uh, we halted it because we are actually improving it tons uh, in such a way that it can run in clusters and supercomputers for academia. But what we built is a tool called Orchestra that allows you to run quantum computer calculations in production mode. You basically run them with all these different packages, including tequila, but it could be all these packages listed here, in quantum hardware that is simulated AKA a supercomputer or real quantum hardware. And on top of that, you have in the back databases and you have Tableau and other softwares to visualize what the heck happened. And this is what Zapata uses with his clients, such as British Petroleum, to actually carry out uh, real production calculations. And this is an example of a simulation that we did, uh, some early version of tequila, sorry, of, 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 of orchestra, showing you how the correlation energy of of our simulation of uh, how quantum computers will, will extrapolate, say, uh, correlation energy with respect to number of qubits, uh, all run in, in our quantum backend. Well, just to give you an idea what the quantum computer does. So now let's end with experiments, right? I mean, it's pretty cool to end with experiments. So it's funny because this is only four years old, what I'm showing you here, and it looks like ancient. This was run in the first quantum computer that Google had kind of in their fridge. Uh, uh, we published it in PRX in 2016. This is the hydrogen molecule run without any kind of approximation uh, uh, in terms of 
tricks in terms of is the scalable implementation of the variational like in solver algorithm compared to the exact answer that is the red line. I don't have enough time to, to go into more details. So I'm gonna be paying through this to be able to end in time. But what I'm showing you here is just kind of historically, one year later or two years later, this doesn't have the year and I keep having the problem, but we published in the in the PRX uh, with a group of uh, Rainer Blatt, we published the lithium hydride. Now this is actually a four qubit type simulation. Um, then a year later, uh, in 2017, uh, IBM did uh, the um, seven qubit experiment, the beryllium hydride molecule. It was an issue paper. And I love this paper. We, you can see the qubits drawn, the orbitals drawn on top of the qubits. This is kind of like Feynman's idea, right? This is so beautiful because this particular plot is harking back to the original idea of Feynman, right? You can see here these, cube, these qubits really representing actual physics. Ion traps, you might have heard this company called IonQ just went through a pop process for becoming public called SPAC. So it's, it's expected to be worth $2 billion. This company that is doing ion traps is incredible. This is happening nowadays. Here is a paper that just came out last year by Google, 12 qubit simulation of Hartree Fock, a very simple example, but Hartree Fock on a quantum computer. It gives you an idea of the type of circuit. Remember the number of qubits and the number of gates that you can do in a regular array of qubits on a quantum computer and still get a, a reasonable answer that has chemical accuracy in terms of your model. Okay, not chemical accuracy, pre chemical precision with respect to your model, not chemical accuracy. Okay, so this is very important, right? Because it's a snapshot of where we are in the field in terms of what we can do. Needless to say, all of this can still be done on classical computers. But we eventually will approach that era of quantum advantage. How far away are we? This is the out the, the basically unveiling of the project of Separa with uh, with uh, BP, right? That allowed us to be orchestra. And again, a lot of advances that we're working on with Separa now in my lab will make this obsolete very soon. In the sense that, for example, the MRA VQE that I just told you before, the measurement. Uh, tricks that my friend uh, and collaborator Artur Ismailov is doing allows to actually be much more optimistic than my own company, Zapata, as it published this paper that is kind of now superseded by many different advances. But it tells you that in that particular paper, Zapata colleagues estimate that for the exact simulation, so to speak, extrapolating to, the, to that real good basis, you will require 72 days to simulate this type of molecules related to combustion, okay, that BP is interested on. So obviously we can reduce the number of qubits with respect to the number of electrons by the trick I just told you about, even by a factor of 10. We could also reduce the number of measurements with in turn, we reduce the number of days here. And remember this scales as the fourth power of the molecule. So these, these numbers will come down substantially. Having said so, we're at the moment where we have real benchmarks of what will quantum computers be doing and it only is getting better, okay? So there's this paper that Leonie Muck, uh, growth a few years ago, talking about the future, okay? Uh, this was paper appeared in Nature Chemistry, and you know, around this, this year of 2015, and I'm very bullish on this because you can actually see the different systems simulated on the different, more and more complicated chips as we go along. And she and I have a public bet that a quantum computer will be able to do something fancy, beating a, a classical computer somewhere in this time scale. If, if it happens in this purple arrow, she owes me a bottle of champagne. The irony is that in this paper, Leonie was a little bit against the whole field. Uh, and now she works actually in a quantum computing company called River Lane. So I love that irony in, in a good way, actually. Leonie is a good friend of Johannes and mine, and she, she does that. Now, just to really, really end, um, we are now in an era that is amazing. This is an announcement of the IBM roadmap, OK? You can see here how IBM is showing that by 2023, they plan to have a thousand qubits in their chips and then hopefully get to millions. I'm really excited because we're in 2021. So I look forward to trying to get my hands on one of these chips that slowly, slowly is gonna be able to do quantum chemistry. And on that note, I'm gonna end with a picture of my, of my research group here uh, in, in Zoom mode. And I really, of course, this, this, this has been done by them.
Uh, I really want to single out here uh, a couple of people. Uh, but for example, Jacob Kaufman did the tequila package uh, with Somner, which is here. Uh, he probably is, is uh, our, our most uh, fancily dressed here in the picture with his jacket. Uh, and uh, Alba Cervera has done a lot of this work. Uh, Tija, what is Tija? Tija is here. Uh, and of course, many of the graduate students uh, here have been extremely important. Uh, let me find Avinav. Avinav Anand has done tons of work on this as well. Here is Avinav. And I could keep mentioning uh, many of my quantum subgroup members. And on that note, uh, I'm really gonna uh, try to use the remainder of the time for questions. And I really thank you for your attention. All righty, thanks so much, Alan. That was a very interesting uh, presentation, and uh, it's a yeah, it's quite amazing how how quickly the field is is moving. All right, so people can put in questions in the uh, chat if you uh, really would like to. You can also um, speak up, uh, raise your hand, uh, and unmute yourself. And uh, maybe to get things going, so I I do have a question which I didn't get around to asking earlier. So when it comes to quantum error correction, it's a big issue that you're uh, basically building in redundancy and you're burning qubits uh, that you can't use for actual things. Is that the that the biggest challenge? Yeah, so I skipped all of it. Right? It's very hard to just tell you, you saw how fast the field is moving, but the, the, in a nutshell, you will need hundreds of qubits to simulate or even thousands. Actually, excuse me, I'm telling you even wrong. Tens of thousands of qubits to simulate a single qubit. So to be able to, 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 to error correct a qubit, you need uh, this very complicated classical computer analyzing the measurement outcomes of many of these 10,000 qubits, okay, just to preserve perfectly the quantum information in this qubit, but perfectly, which means I believe there's going to be a Nobel Prize to the first people that achieve quantum error correction because humanity would have fought the coherence perpetually. So if I was a person that had this 10,000 qubit machine, I will take a qubit and just preserve it and operate on it very simply as a pendulum for a year and have the first quantum object that is not decohering because I'm actively correcting its decoherence by basically pumping out entropy of the system. So the most important discovery I think in quantum computing has been uh, by Peter Short showing that error correction is possible because without it, we wouldn't be here. So yes, when will these quantum computers with error correction will be able to do this full-blown quantum chemistry with tons of qubits Maybe we will be old men, Johannes, you and I, some of those two professors that do not retire and people will be doing this. But what we'll be seeing in our time scale, I'm pretty sure is the NISC, the advent of error correction, right? And the first applications that beat a classical computer. And I think that for chemistry could potentially be transformational even before we enter error correction. And that's my bet on the table. Yeah, so don't move too quickly. So uh, otherwise, <laughs> you will make the entire field of computational quantum chemistry obsolete. On no, 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 no. <laughs> many, uh, many of my former detractors, uh, which were mocking this field, you might know some of them. Uh, now I see their names listed on grants doing quantum computing for chemistry. And I just smile very profusely at how the field comes quickly. And we welcome them in the field. I think X who has a question. Yes. And if who is a graduate student, I don't know if he, he or she is. Uh, Actually, I'm interested. not a graduate student. Okay. So you yeah. won't get 20 bucks. The first yeah. graduate student <laughs> that has a question will get 20 bones from me at any conference. And they could be Canadian or USD, but you mm -hmm. have to interrupt me in a conference and then I will answer your question. So hopefully a graduate student goes next. So. Yeah. Okay, uh, so what's your name again, X? Uh, actually, my name is Xue Donghu. Um, okay. We actually interacted a little bit back when you were in Harvard. Uh, I, was, I went to visit you. I think you were at the beginning of quantum simulation studies. Fantastic, Xue uh, Yeah. So, so now you're anyway, so now I, you're I have a, a... Now you're in Yeah, you're... I, mean, I mean Buffalo. I was in Buffalo at the time, actually. Okay, so let's do. I don't know if you remember Frank Honore. I went to visit uh, you with him and a couple of his Ah, friends. okay. Long time now ago. <laughs> I, get it. I remember the visit. Okay, well, nice to see you again. So, nice what's your to see you? Yes. Uh, so, my question is you know, when I think about quantum simulations uh, for chemical reaction, I think about dynamics of molecules, right? You put molecules together. So it's sort of different from when I think about qubits, which are discrete systems. 
in these chemical reactions, you have continuous variables, which would influence your outcome strongly. So how do you actually simulate those continuous variables? Actually, you were co-author on that on a paper for an analog simulator with Franco for reactions, right? I don't I, remember. I, <laughs> I don't think so. No, you weren't? OK, <laughs> because Franco has a paper on that. So okay. maybe I thought you were seeing this because Franco has a paper on no, an no, I wasn't. simulator of reactions. Very good question. Uh, I mentioned briefly this idea of the basis functions, OK? Mm -hmm. So the way people think about it is mostly in this Born-Oppenheimer picture, where you fix the nuclei and solve the electrons at that particular point. Right. So therefore, right. you are doing that at the particular point with a fixed basis. And as I was showing those potential energy surfaces as a function of the molecular distance, mm -hmm. they, they look like you know these Morse oscillators. What we're really doing is, at a given point, we just fix the nuclei. Right. We have exactly. papers, and many other people have papers on how to do dynamics. Mm -hmm. uh, usually for that, we use a grid. Uh, and then the basis will have these wave packets that are moving around. Mm -hmm. But the way you would discretize in real space will be with grids, OK, to answer okay. your question. Okay. But usually okay. in chemistry, what we're talking about is really solving the eigenvalue problem for the electrons in mm -hmm. the Born-Oppenheimer approximation at a fixed nuclear position for the ground or excited states, Okay. to be more okay. precise. I see. Um, and by the way, now that I see your face, now I connect better. Sorry. Mm -hmm. But when you were um, X, you were mysterious. Uh, <laughs> exactly. I start yeah. with an X, so it's. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's like thank me, you. I made. Like, how many? Yeah. It's the generate. Okay. Uh, thank all you. right. Does that Other answer questions? Question? No. Now, students, students, your 20 bucks. Wow, the student. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I love that moment because then they tell me uh, in the meeting, and I'm like, really? You could even trick me because I won't remember. Uh, I will be poor. All right. Okay, Frank's but I, next. I think Frank has a question. Frank, the floor is yours. Uh, hi. Um, so um, I'm just a little bit curious about how people know when the measurement has to be performed because um, when we do the uh, quantum computation, uh, the state doesn't just leap through the helper space, but it follows the uh, Schrodinger's equation and is a uh, it is kind of like a smooth path on the black sphere, but how do people know um, when the evolution has completed and is ready for measurement? Very good question, Frank. Uh, it is almost like music, okay? Because it is true that say, for example, in NMR or something like that, the qubits are undergoing dynamics just, just due to the internal Hamiltonian. And you need to use control pulses to fight that Hamiltonian and keep them in the right angle, okay? Uh, usually, sometimes it could go in a, in a kind of like basis where they still undergo some of the internal dynamics and you kind of can keep track of it. And then you could imagine adapting your measurement basis as the dynamics happens. That, depend, that happens in some platforms. But in the superconducting qubits, luckily, okay, what you're after then is, uh, for example, you can take, uh, the amplitude that you have in two particular states of the qubit, the lowest and the next excited state of this kind of washboard potential, right? And then measure those populations, right? So that would be proportional to an, a measurement along the c-axis of, of your, of your uh, block sphere. And it won't matter really what is happening except the projection with respect to the z-axis, right? So it all, all, in other words, all of that is taken into account by the hardware people that think about the measurement at the hardware level. I usually operate at a little bit higher level where I don't care about that particular detail because I assume that the hardware layer of the quantum computer is abstracted out for me. And when I do a measurement and I said, give me a projection on the x-axis, my quantum control people uh, and the quantum computing uh, hardware people already figured out how that proper measurement is done. Does that make sense? And there is even a startup company called Q Control that focuses on that those particular subjects. Yeah. So <laughs> it's handed over to other people working on quantum control. <laughs> no, I'm serious. Like what the way it works, the, really, mm. the way it works is uh, there is a quantum stack. Now. So I work at the level of the quantum algorithm la layer, like how to put the qubits together and connect them to quantum chemistry packages and all that. 
Mm-hmm. My startup company works even at a higher level of the stack where it's really thinking about workflows and kind of operating systems for quantum computers. How would you really run this in a data center, mm-hmm. right? Kind of like mm-hmm. And then if you keep going down the stack, there are compilers, there are gate level simulations, and then there's physicists at the bottom that are thinking about the measurement process, right? So, mm-hmm. so when we teach this, obviously we go into those stages, but it is the art of abstraction. And this is where it won't be crazy one day that uh, a stack will contain software from quantum control, software from IBM, and software from us, all of it talking to each other the same way your Linux computer contains all sorts of layers. Right. Uh, so that's kind of how you want to think about it. So it's not that I'm throwing it under the rug. It's that luckily, Frank, I don't have personally at my level of algorithm design, I don't have to worry about uh, uh-huh. So, uh, But it's not under the rug, really. I mean, there, are, there is a lot of work on it. Yeah. Yeah, fell out with the mystery, but thanks. Well, hopefully it's not a mystery anymore. Like if you want to get into those details, email me, I'll send you some papers. Uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. All right, are there more, more questions? So there was a raised hand a second ago, but uh, I can't see it anymore. Yeah, come on, raise your hand, people. Only professors asking questions. Uh, come on, students. No question is a stupid question. Actually, you must have a, you might have a better question than all the professors. And there's no good or bad question, by the way. This is just a joke. Come on. Okay, students just want to go have dinner. <laughs> okay, actually, so so uh, to uh, to the last question, I actually have a quick follow up. So your tequila code, right? So uh, I mean, it looks basically like Python code, right? And uh, so how is it? Is there a, a, a compiler underneath, or how is that connected to an actual quantum computer? Ah, uh, okay, so that's cool. So how, what are the layers of tequila? Say you want to run quantum chemistry on it, right? Uh, what is it doing? So first of all, of course, it's a high-level library that just written in Python. Uh, what it what it basically does uh, is the the Python tool that is the most important here is JAX, J A X, which is a library from Google that allows you to do code that can be automatically differentiated. This is important because in a lot of the variational algorithms, you need to get gradients of expectation values. And all of these gradients is a pain in the neck to code analytically, the same way as in quantum chemistry, right, Johannes? So yeah. we, we use that tool to get analytically the gradients the same way as machine learning people do it, as you know very well. So we use the same things as TensorFlow, the same technology like that, TensorFlow-like technology, right? It's not the same one, JAX, but similar idea. So that's the main thing that we built on, but that in turn uh, uses this quantum chemistry packages grabbed by, by Open Fermion. So at the bottom of it, you will have some sort of thing like Psi, psi code running one chemistry package. Then Open Fermi will transform the qubits all the way down to, to fermion operators. We intercept those Hamiltonians and then build the answer set out of them in a fully differentiable way, right? And then transform it to gates that we pass to quantum compilers and, quantums and or, or quantum execution engines more precisely, uh, we pass the quantum assembler, say, as, as it's called, actually, it's called quantum assembler. We will pass that to, for example, IBM's or Google's quantum simulators. Uh, IBM is called uh, Qiskit and, and Google is called Circ. And then they will they will either run on a supercomputer, a simulation of it, or decide to run onto hardware. So as you see already, even in the stack, I was talking about the stack um, as if I was working in a particular level of the stack, now we zoomed into the stack and you saw all sorts of levels of complexity all glued together. As you know, Johannes, you and I, I think we love both Python by kind of high level Python magic, only possible by Jacob Gottman. If you guys are hiring, you should hire Jacob Gottman. Well, many other fantastic posters in my lab that I mentioned. But anyway, if you want a hacker, go for him, he's on the market. All right, very good. Uh, Wahida has a, has a question. Great, Wahida. Um, hello. Thank you so much for the presentation. So my question is, I'm actually interested in your company and your research group. So my question is, are they the same thing or different thing? Because your research group is from University of Toronto and your company is based in US Cambridge. So I'm just confused about that. Oh, no problem, uh, uh, Wahida. So are you a student? Yes. What what student are you? What type of student are you? Um, 
chemical engineering junior. An undergraduate. Undergrad, yes. Oh, fantastic. Okay, first of all, you won 20 bucks. So if you see me at IG or at ACS, or you come to Toronto from Buffalo, find me, I'll give you 20 bucks, okay? So, <laughs> uh, Thank you. Yeah, it's, it's, it's my price to pay for the student to ask questions. So congratulations, you are the first one. Now, uh, to answer your question, separate, okay? So there are some little joint projects that we do, but the way I think about it, it's very philosophical. Look, I'm wearing a Bernie Sanders t-shirt, right? So I believe the government should fund research and that research should be public, okay? Uh, okay, so that particular, that particular uh, idea that basically tells me that whatever I do with my grants, you know, in my group should be just open and like any, anybody should kind of look at it, right? Like, of course, we, don't, we hide the things that are not published before we publish them, but we release everything open source that as much as you can and, you know, whatever. So that basically means that if you work in my lab, then you will be just doing research like any other research group. The company employs people that usually have PhDs, but some master's level people as well, and even some undergrads, but mostly people with master's and PhDs that already know quantum computing. And they do research kind of more in CIA mode, right? They will, they will develop algorithms, patent them, or or do things there that I many times don't know the details about this. I don't want to know to infect my own research group. Uh, but of course, there are some times and we're right now hiring a joint postdoc, by the way. Uh, we're hiring joint, joint postdoc between the two and then there are some projects that we do together. But if you were to work at Zapata, you work at Zapata, if you work in my company, you work in my company. And when I, a student of mine wants to go to Zapata for a summer, I have to apply with them for the pedestrian process and they compete with all the students around the world uh, to get a position or not. So in some sense, we really try to keep them separate. But it is very important. Also, I said that all the research has to be public. It's also very important that we take advantage of commercializing it for the public good, right? So Zapata wants to make one computers a reality so we can take the university technologies and then make them startup companies that give jobs to people, et cetera, and advance America and Canada and so on. And that's, that's also our role as professors. So that's kind of the two hats I wear. Uh, but yeah, sometimes it confuses people, but we keep the two things separate. Same, with, same thing with my company, Cobotics. So literally they talk to each other and I try to not tell, of course, a group what the other one is doing so that, you know, unless I know they're gonna be in a coalition, then I tell them, can I tell them about this? Because my group is doing something similar. Let's make sure we don't scoop each other, right? But that's the kind of the way we think about the companies and the, and the, and the university. Thank you so much. Okay. All right, so we are late on time, but now we can maybe squeeze in a uh, quick one. So Joe has a question. Okay, Joe, the floor is yours. I just had a quick question on uh, like the future of quantum computing. So like obviously when they had like classical computers, it started out like high level, um, you know, building size things. And now we've shrunk down to we're carrying around in our pockets all day. I mean, is the quantum computer really going to be always this separate high level modeling tool? Or do you think that there's going to be a time way down the line when it's as common as classical computers are today. We want to have a quantum laptop. Uh, there is a company called PsyQuantum, okay, that's received a lot of funding and could potentially go even bigger, right? That is using of photons, photons to do quantum computing, they're room temperature, okay? And they're using kind of the same technology that you use uh, for uh, telecommunications and things like that, right? So there are some possibilities of having, first of all, the problem is that most of the quantum computers require um, not to be at room temperature, but superconductors, for example, but uh, this, this photonics, for example, or even ion traps could be run at room temperature. Uh, in terms of miniatur mi miniaturization, obviously the future will tell, I think it's unlikely that, of course, for classical computing tasks that the chips are so useful for, we will really do a quantum computer. So like for running PowerPoint, it doesn't make sense to run a quantum PowerPoint. So you think, I think there will still be always coprocessor type things. The question is, will you have it in your desktop or will it be in a data center or over the cloud? Only time will tell, but definitely as they become more and more ubiquitous, I think the sky will be the limit in the same way classical computers, people went they designed that there was a famous quote you might have heard IBM was saying there will only be a market for five computers in the world. This was the CEO of IBM, I think. 
And that's example. That's exactly why I don't want to tell you that quantum computers will not be extremely ubiquitous, but you have to understand they are not as powerful as doing PowerPoint than a classical one. And I doubt that eventually you will run your PowerPoint off a quantum computer. Thank you. That was very informative. All right. Very good. So if there are no more, more questions, then uh, ah, I think. So both Frank, excuse me, Frank is a student. Okay. So Frank, I apologize. So, so both Frank and Wajida get their 20 bones. I guess I'm poorer. Uh, so find me, okay. Sorry, Johannes, sorry for interrupting you, but I guess it's my tradition. You were a postdoc in my lab, so I, 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 I'm used to interrupting you, right? Even That's though all right. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so if there are no more, uh, if there are no more urgent questions, uh, then uh, I think we can wrap it up. Thanks so much, Alan. Uh, that was uh, uh, great. And so it's very nice having you seen again. And uh, thanks everyone else for uh, participating. Nice to see you, Johannes. It's always a pleasure and love to see what you're doing over there. Uh, and if anybody has any questions, I'll put my email in the chat. Feel free to just send me an email. And if you don't, if I don't answer, email me again. And email me again until I answer. And that's my that, that's my Twitter. Um, yeah, uh, see you guys. See you guys when I see you. Johannes, I'll try to text you tonight. Sounds okay. good. Bruce, did you want to say something? Just to say thank you, Alan. It was very nice. Ah, well, well, thank you, Bruce. Uh, nice to meet you and uh, uh, keep running. Okay. Uh, you right. too. Have a See you guys. Bye-bye. See you.